Hello, year seven, eight and nine. It's lovely to see you on this Thursday and our fourth day of Insight Week. So I hope you've enjoyed the sessions so far and we have got an absolutely fantastic afternoon of speakers for you today. So we're going to be joined first by George from the hospitality sector and he's got a fantastic session for you. And then we're going to be looking at health and fitness in the session with joined by a personal trainer. So I am going to introduce you now to George who's going to run today's session and as always, if you've got any questions, you can use the Google form to ask your questions. We'll have a little bit of time to answer those at the end. And there will be some quiz questions as well. And I'll come to you when we get to that. So I'm going to pass over to George for our first session. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so as, as Ms. Doyle said, my name is George. I work at the Edge Hotel School and we, um, we offer degrees like university degrees in events or hospitality management. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the hospitality industry um, you know, what sort of jobs exist, what it is, what, what sort of people it suits. And then we also have an activity um, at, at the kind of end of the session just to give you guys an idea of what life could be like working in, in sort of hotel management and hospitality. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Uh, so if I just do that, right. So hopefully you guys can all see uh, a PowerPoint there with hospitality and events on the, the front cover. Um, so a lot of people, when I say, what is hospitality? They kind of think, oh, is it, is it to do with hospitals or something like that? And, and, it's, and it's not. Um, hospitality is... Um, it's it's an exciting industry. It's global. It's you know it's it's an absolutely enormous industry, and it effectively is everything from things like hotels, restaurants, country clubs, uh, you know, coffee shops, pubs, bars, theatres, cinemas, uh, festivals, you know, all sorts of different events, sports events, corporate events. That's all under the, the big umbrella of, of hospitality. Um, so really, it's it's the economy of experience. It's about offering fun memorable experiences to people um, and and it is as i mentioned it is a global industry you know every country in the world i think except a few have a hotel in them every country in the world has restaurants and i know that unfortunately at the moment we aren't able to to go out and enjoy restaurants with our friends and families or you know go go to fun events or go to like amusement parks or that sort of thing um, but but you know hopefully in the coming months you know that, that starts to change but, but really, hospitality is about wowing clients and customers. And it's not just about customers like me or you. It's also you might be working with huge clients, uh, Amazon, Google, Apple. They all have commercial and hospitality you know, pa partners. They have uh, teams within their teams that, that run events and, and, do, and do hospitality and that sort of thing. So it is a really huge industry that encompasses loads and loads of different types of jobs. And as I said, it is it is big. So in 2018, it was the third largest employer in the UK. Um, it contributed to around 3.2 million jobs through direct employment, and then a further few million from indirect employment. Um, and 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 most importantly, I suppose for for people you know such like your ages, um, is that hospitality is one of the largest employers of young people. So you know, in, in a few years' time, when you might be looking for part-time work as well as your studies it could very well be a hospitality organization that you join uh, you know in, as it says there in 2013 84 percent of hospitality organizations had employed a young person you know in the last year and 45 percent of those had employed somebody between the ages of 16 and 18. Um, so again it's a really big employer of young people which means as well that there's lots of different ways that you can enter into it from a young age and um, and it and it is it is as I've said, been impacted quite quite severely by coronavirus. But you know, from among myself and my colleagues at the Edge Hotel School, we're firmly of the belief that um, once once everything starts to return back to normal, hospitality and events are going to be one of the industries that really bounces back quickly. You know, everyone kind of wants to be able to go out and enjoy joy experiences with their family or their friends, and at the moment we can't and we miss it. So when we can, you know, we, we're going to go and we're going to do it. A lot more than we are now and we're going to and it's going to hopefully recover really quickly so this is just a quote from a student that we had at the edge hotel school so as i said we we have we offer degrees at our, at our department in in events and hospitality management and we have our own hotel um 
and and really we're trying to basically train up like the next generation of hospitality leaders and and he says here you know in what other industry can you travel the world whilst furthering your career you know his uh, this is luke a former student of ours his hospitality career has opened so many doors for him because he wanted to travel and he came to us to do a degree and he worked for a hotel in london which had a partner hotel in australia and there was a job opportunity at the hotel in australia and and he and he went and, and he went and took that opportunity and he got it and so he, he currently lives in australia um, and and that, but he's still at the same time you know progressing his career and, and having a really sort of beneficial and good time good time working um so what sort of jobs do there what sort of jobs exist in hospitality well as i've said it's really varied there's a lot of different types so one of which could be an attractions manager. So you could be the manager of the day-to-day -day operations at an amusement park. For example, there you see there's a picture of kind of Dis um, Disney Disney World. I think that's in Florida. Um, but you know we have amusement parks here in the UK. Every country kind of has amusement parks, and and that can be. But it's not just them. It's also zoos, like heritage sites, national institutions, landmarks. You know, famous famous buildings in kind of London, historical significance. And the day-to-day -day duties of those can range from anything from, you know, working with suppliers like caterers, working with the government to make sure that you're adhering to all the kind of rules and legislation, working with trade bodies, you know, making sure that your, your, your guests are having a good time, looking after staff and working with the media as well. If you're launching, for example, Disney launches a new ride quite often. And so they'll often invite media to the, to the park to experience it and to write about it. Or you could go into hotel or general management. So you, you would effectively in that role be in charge of a hotel. And that's the activity that we're going to do after I've, I've finished speaking this bit is about being a hotel general manager. And that's overseeing everything in a hotel from like large bookings, from important clients, from large groups of clients, setting kind of business targets, budget targets, being in charge of the marketing and running a team of people that then does all those little things for you. So you are ultimately responsible for everything. Um, alternatively, you can go into events management. So that's, as I said, we teach hospitality and hotel, or we also teach events. And they're two different, two different strands. Um, but events management is a job that changes day to day because no events are kind of the same. Um, you know, you, you can oversee events from the planning stages to you know on the day being in charge of the running of the event and then after the event being in charge of everything then as well so that can involve like you know coming up with different ideas for an event so you see there's a picture of a festival you know the more creative someone's stage someone's set the more exciting it's going to be for the audience um you'd be researching the venues the suppliers the contacts booking the venue and booking the entertainment looking after the entertainment um, and managing a team of volunteers you know i work with with a lecturer who's previously was a manager of the brit awards so he planned a lot of the vip parts of the brit awards meeting all the kind of different celebrities and stuff alternatively you could move into more like interior design so you know hospitality venues and events venues they need to have a really different layout than you know what we have our in, in our own homes they need to be functional but also exciting for guests to be in um so, you know creating spaces for restaurants for hotels for bars for pubs and all that sort of thing thinking about a way to make somewhere fun to be in but also then suits the staff that work there um or you could be a cruise director see the world spend spend a lot of time on the sea um one of our lecturers is, is a former cruise director and he was responsible for planning the activities on the cruise most importantly, planning the food and drinks on the cruise. I don't know if, if you guys have ever been on a cruise. Uh, I haven't, but the food and drink is is a really important part of that because more often than not, they are all inclusive. So all of that stuff is included in the price of the ticket, um, but also being in charge of guest safety and, and making sure that suppliers are never running out. Um, or you could move into wedding planning. So that's another, you know, the weddings tend to be the most important events of, of someone's life, or hopefully. Um, and so you are responsible for delivering that event to them. So making sure that you understand the different wedding customs, different cultures that might exist uh, amongst the bride and the groom and their families. Um, you're working with suppliers, caterers, photographers, florists, venue hire, entertainment, you know, even bigger and grander. You could have dancers, you could have, you have all sorts and also solving problems on the day, putting out the fires that might crop up on the day um, can also be a really big part of that because you want the event to run smoothly. So there are a lot of perks of working in hospitality industry. Um, firstly, as I've mentioned, it is truly global. So it will allow you to travel the world as part of your career. Um, it rewards you thinking creatively and coming up with interesting new ways 
of delivering an event or providing a customer or client experience. Um, and, and no two days are the same, primarily because you're working, as it says there, it's people focused. It's a very people focused industry. So no two days are the same because no two people are the same. And you're always going to be dealing with different people, different issues, different rewards, all that sort of thing. Um, it's full of employee perks. A lot of hotel staff that work in upmarket hotels in, in say, London, for example, um, have access to the facilities. So have access to spa, swimming pools. More often than not, they're often fed as well. By, by the hotel, obviously the hotel provides a lot of food for staff, um, and it's a lifelong career choice. So it, it's something that, because it's so varied, because so many different jobs exist within it, you know, you can start working at like 18 and have not really seen much repetition by the time you retire at like 60, 65, whatever. I know that that seems a very, very long way away, um, but because there's so much going on, that working with so many different people, so many different types of organization, it's something that can be rewarding for that entire time without ever feeling like you're worrying about, um, you know, repeating something or, or getting bored ultimately. And these are some of the characteristics that really work. So if, if you if you recognize some of these characteristics in yourself, maybe you might be thinking, well, actually, hospitality could be a rewarding career for me. And, um, you know, being just a few to pick out as being patient, being calm under pressure, being energetic, uh, being a people person, as I said, being a good team worker, enjoying a challenge. As I said, no two days are the same. So you're constantly challenging yourself to deliver something exciting. You need to be focused. You need to be able to communicate effectively. And you need to ultimately be enthusiastic. Nobody is going to enjoy working in somebody with hospitality. Imagine if you walked into you know, a restaurant and the, and the waiter was very dull, boring, wasn't enthusiastic about your job, didn't make you feel like who valued your customs. You have to be enthusiastic. And there are so many different places you can go. And I'm just, what I've got here is just a couple of slides about some of the more really like interesting variants of like events, hotels, bars, restaurants, that sort of thing. So one is a Propeller Island Hotel in Germany, and that has hotel rooms that are themed just really weirdly. So there's an upside down room there on the top right there. There's a coffin room that you can sleep in. There's a mirror room so that you can see literally everything that's going on in the room all the time. Or there's a like a nuclear fallout bunker room as well. Those are very unique experiences, probably something that you wouldn't want to do every night, but something that, you know, it is a memory and it's something that you could you know, tell your friends about, tell your family about. This is a really lovely uh, resort in the Maldives, Hilton. Um, as you can see there with facilities that literally go underwater, um, you know, rooms that you can have fish swimming above your head or sharks even, but I'm not sure how much I'd like that. Um, that's a really upmarket sort of sort of venue. That's something that the, the very privileged in society can enjoy, but, but they are big employers around the world. And more often than not, sometimes they like local staff. Sometimes they like staff from countries where they're getting most of their guests. So again, that could be something that's really interesting. Coachella is one of the biggest festivals over in America. Um, and you see, see the size of the crowds there, the size of the, the different artwork that they have, the size of that astronaut there. Coachella is a really unique one. It's very popular. It's very big with kind of the celebrities and influencers you have, like, I don't know, like the Kardashians, et cetera, go every year. Um, so that's, that's something else. Or you can have an ice hotel. So this is a hotel where, as, as you can imagine from the name, everything is made of ice. Um, again, sculpted usually by hand um, or you know, some machinery, but that's just, again, a totally unique experience that exists with hospitality. It's totally weird almost in a way, but, but also really cool. Uh, less weird, but definitely nowhere near, um, but definitely more luxurious would, would be like airlines. So we've had staff go into work in kind of really upmarket airline facilities as well. So, you know, it looks like a hotel room, but that, that's a room on a plane. Um, and that's something that, again, is very is very uh, some of this stuff that I'm showing you is very kind of like upmarket, but it's just to give you an idea of the different types of environment that can exist within the hospitality industry. Um, dinner in the sky, ever fancied eating dinner suspended hundreds of feet above the ground? Well, someone thought of that, and now you can. They actually do that uh, by the O2 as well. I've I've seen that in the O2 in London. Um, so again, that's something that, that is over here as well. Very unique, very interesting. Um, obviously, people are all strapped in because you, you don't want anyone falling out. Um, and then this one is is effectively it is just a nice, luxurious bed 
in the Swiss Alps. So you are really one with nature at that point, but you are sleeping under a starry sky. You've got all these amazing views around you. It's probably quite chilly, um, but you also have a butler uh, as part of that experience who's able to provide you with kind of food and, and drink. Um, I'm not sure why he's just standing over them there whilst they're in bed there, but you know, whatever. Um, but but that's a really interesting experience as well as something that, that, that exists within the hospitality sector. Now, it might seem weird me saying this because I am working from a university. I, I work at the Edge Hotel School. There are so many different ways to get into hospitality um, that, that you might not be aware of. So it's not just about going to university and getting a degree. You, you can do that. And it certainly does help, I think, in the long term in, in terms of giving you the knowledge and the skills to kind of really just kickstart a career sooner. Um, and these are some of the subjects that kind of work for that. So, you know, hospitality management, travel, tourism, leisure, events management, business studies, uh, even like economics, that sort of thing. It can all be really handy um, in, in, in transferring those skills over to, to the hospitality and events. Um, there are apprenticeships. A lot of places offer apprenticeships that are available. Um, and, and also, you know, work experience. As I said, it's one of those industries that employs people from a really young age. So, um it could be that you start getting work experience at like 16, 17 and just work your way up through perhaps starting a lot of people starting kind of like working as waiters or, or waitresses or working in you know retail and then and then just working their way up through their career until eventually they could be running their own restaurant. You know, I mean, a lot of famous chefs like Gordon Ramsay and, and Jamie Oliver would have started by doing those sorts of things, those sorts of smaller jobs and then working their way up. And, and that's and that's kind of something in hospitality is that anyone can do that as long as you just are passionate about what you do and that you work hard and that you are good at dealing with people. So that's a really quick rundown of the hospitality industry. I now have uh, an activity that we, we can do. I think um, Miss Doyle said uh, she's got some questions. So if I just go off of that and go back. Oh, don't want to see my emails. Um, so. This is an activity that we, we run when, when I've been able to go into schools. This is an activity that we run, but obviously we can't really do that at the moment. Um, so one of the really important things, issues that the world is facing, but hospitality as well, is our environment and how what we are doing is impacting our environment. And unfortunately, uh, the hospitality industry is a, is a really big contributor to, to kind of environmental issues because of the nature of the operation, 24 hour hotels running their energy all the time uh, or events taking place, uh, causing sort of pollution, stuff like that. So we are having to really start to think about how we um, improve our practices in the, in the hospitality sector for uh, improving our sustainability. So if I just scroll down, so as part of this, this, this activity, basically you are now, you guys, you know, watching, watching, watching me on the screen, are the general manager of a 40 bedroom, four star hotel. This is the hotel. So this is actually the Edge Hotel School. This is our hotel. Um, and you are being trusted by the owners of the property to run the hotel as best as you think, as long as it makes a profit. And, and that's one of the things we're gonna have to think about for this, this, present, this, this activity, is that we want you to think about ways to improve the environmental impact of what we're doing, but also as a hotel, you need to think about how much money stuff costs. You, any business needs to make money. And you also need to be thinking about the customer experience because ultimately if a customer has a rubbish experience, they're not gonna come back. They're gonna tell their friends. We saw research that suggests if one person has a bad experience in a hotel or a restaurant, they're gonna tell 10 people about that experience, minimum. So you have to make sure that you're giving a good customer experience as well. So, so part of the challenge is that we're going to be asking you four different questions today and you need to th ignore the stuff about points. Normally, if we were doing this in a classroom, we would be assigning points and numbers and you would be in teams, but that's a bit tricky to manage online. Um, but in most of these departments, so you're going to get four questions from four different departments and you need to think about which option you think is best taking into account the stuff I've said about making sure that you're not spending too much money or losing money, that you are making sure that you're not affecting the customer experience too much, but also you're benefiting the environment. So here's the first one, food wastage. The kitchen department, which produces uh, food for the restaurant, and, and this is a, a sort of scary fact, one third of the food produced in hotels and restaurants is wasted. 
That is a huge amount of food. Um, and they have some suggestions for you for reducing the the amount of food waste that they have. And these are these are the, the options. So you can reduce the amount of food that's being served per portion. You can send the food to the customer, send the food that the customers don't eat to a bio fertilizer. Or number three, you can offer customers different portion sizes and prices. Or four, offer customers doggy bags, you know, sort of takeaway bags that they can take so that they can take the uneaten food home with them. So as I've said, and, and I should probably say that none of these answers are wrong, but we at the school think that there are some answers that are better than others at facing the different challenges of being environmentally friendly, saving or not wasting money, and also not affecting the customer experience too much. Um, so I think, uh, Ms. Doyle, did you say that there's a, like a poll or something that can go out? There is. So on your Google Classroom, guys, if you look at quiz question one, and I can see some of you have jumped straight onto that, you've got four possible answers that um, George has just gone through for you. So what do you think would be the best solution? I can see we've got about 30 answers through already, and there's 130 of you on this call. So a couple more answers. We'll give you a minute to think about. At the moment, we've got one clear winner what you think oh the answers are flooding in now so click on quiz question one and we'll see and, and 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 what i'll do guys as well is after each question once we've we've gone through the answers i'll go through every answer and why we think some might be better than others but as i said always remember it has to be environmentally friendly as possible but you need to make sure that you're not spending too much money on a process which might impact the profits of your hotel and also that you're not doing something that might negatively impact the customer experience. So it's important to remember all those things and remember that you are the general manager here of a four star hotel. So it's it's a sort of a, a nice classy venue, probably classier than the sorts of places I would go to. Um, but it, it's a nice a nice venue for people. So so bear that sort of stuff in mind as well, the type of uh, guests that they might have. Um, but as, as Ms. Doyle said, happy to wait another 30 seconds or so, and then we can go through some of the answers. Yeah, last 30 seconds, guys. I can see lots of answers coming in. And it's interesting. I've got a nice interactive pie chart on my screen that is changing rapidly as these answers come in. So it is nice to see. Okay, so we have two front runners. The winner okay. at the moment with 44.6% is option number two. So send the food that the customers don't eat to be converted into bio okay. fertilizer. And then number two in second place with 33.3% is offer customers different portion sizes. Okay, that's really interesting. It's it's funny every time we we kind of get different answers uh, for these, so it's it's useful. As I've said, none of the answers are wrong at all. Some of these are really good suggestions. And um, so, actually, at Edge Hotel School, and um, we found that actually option number one of reducing the amount of food being served per portion was overall the most effective strategy, and, and I'll and I'll go into why. Um, for, for number two, which a lot of you guys said about the biofertilizer, um, converting food into biofertilizer is a really expensive process. So if you're doing that as the and you have to pay for it as well, you don't get paid to do that. The, the restaurant would have to pay to convert that food into biofertilizer. And um, that can be a really expensive process. So whilst it would most certainly be one of the most environmentally friendly, it would impact the hotel's profits potentially to such a way that the balance isn't there. And then offering customers different portion sizes and different prices as well, you could still get quite a lot of people, and I know that I'm guilty of this, I definitely feel like I can eat more than I can. So I always order more food than I can eat, despite the fact that I'm actually a pretty large guy. I always order more food than I can eat. And that still means that there's potentially going to be food wastage. So the first option, just reducing the amount of food being served per portion, if it's good quality ingredients, you're, you're not having that wastage in the first place. And it kind of reflects a trend of people not wanting to order huge big portions, but rather just ordering good quality, smaller portions that don't make them feel sick after they've finished. Um, 
option number four, the doggy bags. As I've mentioned in, in the explanation there, we are a four-star kind of upmarket hotel. And a lot of guests might feel self-conscious to ask for doggy bags, takeaway bags in, in a posh restaurant like that. So um, as I said, you have to think about everything when we're doing this. But again, no wrong answers. A lot of the suggestions that you guys would have made would still work. And if, and you know, as I said, with the biofertilizer one, it would be the most environmentally friendly, probably by quite some way. Uh, so question number two is about reducing energy usage. So as I mentioned, hotels are basically open 24 hours a day. And after labor costs, energy costs are some of the most expensive costs in running a hotel. So the housekeeping department, which looked after the cleaning and maintenance of rooms, have some ideas about how we can reduce the amount of energy that guests use during the stay. So number one, install heat sensors or trigger switches in the rooms, which turn off the power when the customer leaves the room. Number two, putting up signs asking customers just to turn off their lights and turn down the temperature in their rooms when not required. Three, changing the current older lighting system for a new LED lighting system. Or number four, charge the customers an additional amount if they use more than a certain amount of power each day. So have a think about all of those and all of the things we've kind of said there. Um, and I'll give you another minute because I'm conscious I don't want to take up too much of your time and that there is a session after me. Um, but I'll give you a minute or so, and then we can go through these answers as well. Amazing. And that's, I can see most of you have found it. It's quiz question two in your Google Classroom. I can see those answers already. But it's quiz question two for you. So something worth thinking about, guys, when, you, when you're debating it is, is remember that we are an, a four-star country house hotel, so we're quite old as a building, um, which might mean that we're not too energy efficient. Um, and, and also remember that the customer experience is also key. So we want to be avoiding things that might annoy customers and might give them a negative experience. Um, and again, also trying to make sure that we're helping the environment as much as we can, but we're also not spending all of our money because obviously we, as a business, do some need to make money to pay our staff and things like that and pay for, you know, nice renovations or nice, nice landscaping, that sort of thing. George, uh, I yeah, think it's been a minute. Runner. Yeah, we've got a front runner on this. So with 57.1% of the votes, everyone's gone for yep. option one. Option so one. Okay. Okay. So, so for this one, actually option one is, is one of the best ones. It's we, we would go with either option one or option two. Option one, as you say, is really good because it's kind of reading that if someone's not using something, they don't need to, it doesn't need to be on, right? So, so it's turned off and it, and that stops. Sometimes guests leave their, like leave their lights on or they leave their heating on and that's wasting energy. You might know if, if you guys have you know been in hotels at all, uh, that sometimes you have to put the key into the room, into like a slot by the door to actually turn on all the power. And that's something very similar to option number one. We also think number two is good because it's a lot cheaper than the others. Just putting up signs, it's relatively expensive, but it's giving your guests the control to, to do what they want. So, for example, some guests value more if their room is nice and toasty when they walk into it. They're happy to waste the energy. Well, we're not, but customer experience is also important. Um, they might leave, leave the heating on a little bit. So it's giving them control. Option three would be really expensive, particularly in an old building like ours. Replacing light systems takes a lot of money and a lot of time, and it would take probably a while before we would see the changes that we need to see. Um, and charging customers an additional amount of energy for what they use, that wouldn't fly. Not in a four-star hotel. We think people would be very annoyed if we were charging them extra power to be using in a hotel because they're going away to relax and enjoy themselves. And imagine getting a bill for 20 quid's worth of extra TV energy or something like that. Uh, question three, waste management. The reception department, which is looking after customer experience, has some suggestions for, for reducing the amount of rubbish that we have in our hotel. Those are, one, providing separate recycling bins in customer rooms. Two, stop offering free newspapers to customers in their rooms. Three, stop providing branded plastic bottles of water for customers in their room. Or four, don't supply individual miniature soap or shampoo or shower gels in their rooms. So I'll give you guys another minute to think about that, to think about those different options. I hope you're able to read that on screen. I can see the writing is a little bit smaller, but hopefully you're able to, 
make heads or tails of that. Um, but yeah, and, and try to remember all the sort of details that we spoke about um, about about uh, you know customer experience, uh, cost of cost of implementing something, and the impact it can have on the environment. Um, so and I you... so guys, that's quiz question three in your worksheets. I can see lots of you have already got it. And again, there's one clear winner at the moment. Okay. So the clear winner with 67% at the moment is option number one. Okay. Providing separate recycling bins in customer rooms. And that and that's is that going up as well? More than 67% now? 68.5%, 69%. Okay, well it's clear then. I don't think any more are going to come and come and come and be that one. So uh, yeah, so for us. We think either option three or option one are some of the best. So as you said, so you guys that picked option one, you're on the right idea. Providing separate recycling bins in customer rooms is a really good way of just filtering out all of the, the, the rubbish, obviously, it's a bin, um, that, that our guests use. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of hotels, it's still at the moment, they only offer one bin. Um, and people just put everything in there. Um, so, so that's a really good one. The reason that we also pick number three is that, even with one with the recycling bins, you, you are still actually at that point creating that waste. Um, with option three, I don't, I don't know how much you guys know about the kind of uh, like landfills and, and, and environmental damage, but single use plastics are one of the most damaging plastics, uh, one of the most damaging um, materials for, for our environment thrown away a lot, filling up landfills around the world um, and, and not providing the plastic bottles is a good way of us avoiding contributing to the issue of single use plastics as a hotel, but also saving money. Because you have to think about when, if you're providing branded plastic bottles in your hotel, you have to negotiate a contract with a provider. You have to buy the materials, you know, buy the suppliers, and then you need to get rid of them afterwards. So one option is actually providing kind of like rewashable glass bottles that replaced every day. Um, not like with a new bottle, but it would be washed and then and then replaced. Um, option two is kind of irrelevant, actually, because a lot of people don't use newspapers anymore. A lot of people read the news on tablets or their phones. And uh, option four, um, not supplying miniature soap or shampoo. I mean, it's probably pretty evident that I don't really need to use much shampoo, um, but more, most guests would be quite annoyed to be in a four-star hotel and not have those sorts of luxuries provided. Um, so final question, reducing water usage. Um, I'm conscious I want to rush through this. The housekeeping department have some suggestions for reducing the amount of water that your customers are using. One, install tap aerators and dual flush toilet systems. So they're the ones you see the toilets have two different flushes, one for number one and one for number two. Um, number two. Option number two is putting up signs asking customers to reuse the same towels for up to three days. Number three, install sensors on the taps so that they turn off automatically when not in use. Or number four, install a gray water system to recycle water from baths and showers to use in toilets. So have a think there. Maybe I'll only give you 30 seconds for this one because I'm conscious that we might be running over. Um, and I do love to talk too much, to be fair. Um, so have a think about that. Pick an option there, and then we'll quickly go through the answer there. This is the final question as well. But um, hopefully this activity has just given you guys an idea of the sorts of issues that somebody as a hotel general manager would have to deal with day to day to make important strategic decisions for their organization. Do we have a front runner at the moment, Ms. Doyle? We do with fifty four percent at the moment is option number three. Option number three, okay. Um, okay, so for us, actually, uh, we think option number one is better: installing tap aerators and dual flush toilets. So, the reason we haven't gone for number three um, is because I don't know if you guys have ever encountered a tap with a sensor that isn't working properly, but it can be really annoying to constantly have to like swipe under a sink to get some water. And also a lot of people like to, in especially in a hotel, a luxury hotel, they might want to fill up the sink a little bit, for example, to properly wash their hands or, or if they're having a shave or something. And those sorts of taps don't allow you to do that unless you literally stand there the whole time with your thumb over the sensor to turn it on. The reason we pick number one is that dual flush toilet systems are actually relatively cheap and they save a lot of water. If you if you're just only flush, say you're doing the, the mild flush for like a number one, just going to the toilet, that's saving a lot more water. Um, 
Number two, uh, we, we've not gone for number two, putting up signs, asking customers to reuse the same towels. Some people are willing to do that. You know, we use towels more than once whilst we're at home, usually. Well, I know that I do, but then I am sometimes quite lazy. Um, but but in a hotel, a four-star hotel, they might expect, actually, you know, we would expect to have clean towels every day. Um, and then the installing a grey water system. So that is effectively using used water from baths and sinks and showers and using them in toilets. Some people actually don't like the idea of those systems. They think it's a bit just unpleasant to, to be doing that. It's actually completely fine. It's actually completely safe, but it's the perception of that. And also that they are actually very expensive systems to install. So of those, we would say, yes, options one and three are the best, but we personally would think number one is the best. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, that is the end, guys, um, of, of this of this activity. Thank you very much for listening to me today. I appreciate I do ramble on a bit sometimes. Um, and thank you as well to Miss Doyle for inviting me in. If you are ever interested in working in hospitality or you have any more questions about today's session, feel free. Uh, Miss Doyle has my email contacts. And so I'm sure I'm happy for my email to be given out to anyone if anyone's interested in potentially working in our industry or alternatively, Actually, I could just put our department's email in the chat. I hope, can everyone see this chat, Mr. Oliver, if I put that in there? No, they can't, but I can share it okay. with them. Okay, 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 you can share it. So I've, I've just put it in there in our chat then. Oh, so when I said hi, everyone earlier, it was literally just saying that to you. Um, but but yeah, so hopefully you guys have enjoyed today's session. Very much appreciate you in, uh, inviting me on. Um, and yeah, as again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask uh, either now or, you know, ask later on via our email. Brilliant. Thank you so much, George. It's been amazing. And some of those hotels at the end that you were showing us looked fantastic and really yeah. exciting places that people could work. I've had a couple of questions through, but what I might get you to do if I if I sort of email those across to you and we'll add them yeah, to Yeah, absolutely. I'll, 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 email, I'll, I'll answer those straight away. I'm happy to do that and, and try and get back to you in the next couple of days with the answers. Brilliant. So, guys, any of those questions that you've put through that haven't been answered, and I can see some of those were being answered as George went through his presentation, but any that haven't, then I will make sure that we get the answers and we'll share those with you in the classroom tomorrow. But a huge thank you, George, from everyone. Cheers. Here. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you. Guys, that was a fantastic start to this afternoon, and we're going to go straight into our next session. So we're going to be looking at the fitness industry and I'm going to introduce you now to Miles who is joining us who is going to run the next session. Hello, how are we? Um, can you see my screen? We can. Perfect, just going to go into the full screen. Does that work? Perfect. Okay, so um, welcome. My name is Miles. Uh, I am a personal trainer and owner of a company called MEPT. So today, um, hopefully I can give you just an insight on the path of a personal trainer, some of the insights and what the job entails, and also sort of how to get the qualification and succeed within the job. Um, hopefully I can get this done within sort of 20 minutes and give you some time for questions that you may have at the end. So, loves the personal trainer. Just a little bit of a background on me. So I went to Iris School, so not obviously too far from where you are. Um, well, I think I left there in 2015, 2016, so I'm 21. Um, from after my GCSEs, obviously you had to stay into education. 218. So I went to Northwest Kent College, which is obviously in uh, Wilmington, to study my level two fitness instructing and level three personal training. Um, the first year you do your level two fitness instructor, and then the second year, once you've passed that, you go on to do your level three personal training. Now, alongside that, you're also studying for a BTEC A level PE. Now, um, additional to this, I've been um, a level two swimming instructor for five years. So since I was sort of 16, 17, which has obviously helped um, me with that teaching aspect of things and coaching. Um, I was a swimmer myself ever since the age of sort of uh, seven and eight, swimming for Ethan District Swimming Club. So I've always been sort of within the sports um, field. Now I've been a personal trainer for coming up to my fourth year. Um, my first job was at David Lloyd. So there's many David Lloyds around. 
Uh, you've got one in Dartford. I worked in the one at Kidbrook. So I, on my 18th birthday, um, I got my first job there. Within sort of nine months of working there, obviously I was employed um, as a personal trainer. I left after nine months um, and decided to sort of go fully self-employed and run my own business. Um, and I did this out of a small studio that I actually left with two other PTs that used to work at David Lloyd in the time. Um, and they bought and rented a studio sort of five minutes away. And I just went and worked there. Two and a half years ago, so I got a job offer to work as a personal training a personal trainer for a new premium co-working company called Fora. So the company is about four years old. Um, it had three buildings when I first uh, got offered the job. One of the buildings had a small studio space in. Um, the building basically it hosts residents and companies that want to buy a small office space within our building and I PT um, the residents and companies from there. Fast forward to now, we actually have 13 buildings within London, so all over sort of Soho, Borough High Street. Um, and now I'm actually the head personal trainer that runs all the one to one PT, group personal training, private corporate sessions, and resident classes. Alongside this, I now also run an online business through a client programming app called True Coach, um, which is obviously helps me in both ways. It's obviously the in person stuff and obviously online now. So moving on, that's about enough about me. So personal training, so the skill assets and the education sort of pathway. Now, a lot of people sort of sometimes think of a personal trainer as someone that just trains clients, put them through a workout, you see them for an hour and then you leave. Really, a good personal trainer is someone that can sort of individually assess a, any client that walks in from you, you're going to be having people from, say, 18 years old all the way up to so my oldest client, 68. So different parts of their stages of their life, their movement is completely different, their needs are different. So it's up to you as a personal trainer to assess those um, from sort of a movement screen that you do at the start. From this sort of you uncover the foundations of them, what needs to be within their program structure when they come on board. It's not just, unfortunately, writing down a little workout for them to do. They get on with it and that's it. Okay, to be able to be a sort of, like I said, one of the really good personal trainers, um, you need to be able to have the sort of skill assets of a good listener. You need to understand the client that's in front of you. Um, you need to also build a good rapport with the client. And that all feeds client retention. Obviously, as a personal trainer, you can see five clients in one year the next year you could get another 10 clients and what the best thing to do is obviously you want that client retention and you want those clients to be with you moving forward from your years so i've had some of my clients from my first ever job so from 18 some of my first clients they're still with me now now from all these skill assets of this personal training aspect you've got the education which obviously you look at the skeletal muscular systems. So this is obviously all learned within your BTEC A-level PE, but also you do some of this within the fitness instructing side. And then when you move on to that personal training qualification in the second year. Um, so the muscular systems, you go through training systems, exercise mechanics, nutrition, and there's many more sort of topics that you will go through. Now, obviously I went through the college route because obviously I had to leave, well, I had to stay in education. So it was over a two year period. Now it does seem sort of quite a long time. There are courses out there that you can go and do obviously a personal training qualification. I think some of them even do it within six weeks. It's a hell of a lot of money. Um, obviously if you go to college, you're gonna get it for free, but also just got to think of, there's so much to learn within sort of the level two and level three can you truly learn within six weeks? Probably not. It took me two years and I'm still learning now. So for me, I would say if it's something that you obviously want to do, I always knew I wanted to be something within the fitness industry. Um, two years when I knew that I'd have to stay in education um, was a sort of a no brainer for me. Um, as a personal trainer, when you sort of getting clients come to you, 
you don't just help them with their physical side. You also help with their man- mental aspect, especially now with the COVID situation. Mental health being such a such a big topic and something you've, we've we've really had to focus on with all my clients, um, and also the lifestyle habits. So it's helping them to overcome barriers. And like I said, everyone is different and you're going to have so many different type of people coming up to you wanting to train with you um, and their lifestyles are completely different. So that's, that's something that obviously you've got to sort of take into consideration. It's not obviously training someone. You've got to look at the different aspects of the mental um, and obviously the nutrition side as well. Um like I said before, you've got level two fitness instructing that allows you. So once you've qualified for your level two fitness, so that allows you to take classes um, and group sessions. So if you, for example, joined a leisure centre to become a fitness instructor, you can take their group classes, but you would not be able to individually train someone. Once you then get obviously the level three personal training qualification, this is when you can do everything so one-to-one training group training um the lot so yes after that first year it is a little bit of a kick in the teeth because you do know a lot and enough probably to go and train someone individually but obviously the qualification means everything so you obviously got to do that second year for that level three now that's where sort of i stopped after i got my level three personal training i just moved on got myself a job um and I've done courses, and there's so many courses out there, depending on what path you'd like to go through, whether it's the rehabilitation path, um, which obviously you can go to uni and do physiotherapy, uh, osteopathy, um, or you've got sort of the strength and conditioning side again, which would have to go to uni. But there are different courses out there that you can just pay for um, over sort of a short period of time, um, depending on obviously what you'd like to focus on. Now... GCC grades. So most of you have, I think, year seven, eights, and maybe a few year nines. So we are sort of moving up that pathway. Now, the college that I went to, they will not allow you to onto this specific course without passing your maths and English. So it was back when I was doing it, it was a, a C. I think your numbers now um, is, a, is a four plus. So that is crucial. So if it's something that you definitely would like to think about, you need to make sure obviously you're putting the work and effort in now to be able to when you go and to, uh, sort of get yourself onto the list to get to do the personal training course. Um, you've obviously passed that maths and English. Now, do you need it? Yes, you do. As a PT, there are many instances where you'll need a good understanding with numbers and no good literature. So obviously for me, I've put a sort of, a, I don't know if you can really see that, it's just a draft. Now this is an Excel spreadsheet that I have to make for my business. You need to track on the monthly hours, PT you work, online coaching hours you put in, income, then you work out percentages of um, the hourly rate compared to, with the hours worked. And all these statistics are, are in order for you to grow your business and you will need to do at some point. If obviously when you start out as a personal trainer, depending whether you're employed or self-employed, um, which obviously you can go in both ways, you might have to, for the first couple of years, sort your own tax out. So that way you're going to have to work with numbers quite a lot. Um, Literature-wise, obviously, you need to be able to write emails, um, to which could lead to new potential clients. Um, as a, my sort of online business, I write PDF documents. So when someone comes, or a new client comes on board, there's a process of different PDFs that they get sent. Obviously, with those PDFs, it is like a selling point. Um, that's that first point of call when a client sees you and gets to know what you're like. Obviously, being able to write the PDFs and documents with correct structure um, is what you're going to need. Moving on. So as you're obviously a little bit younger and we're not going through those GCSEs and we, we can't go and do, obviously, the qualification yet, what can you do now to gain some knowledge? Now, I started with my swimming uh, club. I started coaching at the age of sort of 15. Now, obviously, it was volunteering. I was coaching 
kids that are probably eight, nine. So if some of you, some of you may be swimmers, footballers, netball. I'm sure within your clubs, you have different age groups is that you can go and volunteer and help to coach. Now, this coaching aspect is so crucial and it helps to gain the experience that you will need. It's it's the experience of how to, you can come across to a client, how how you um, express yourself um, and all those things are vital um, when when being a personal trainer. Now, you can t- start to take part in personal training classes, uh, boot camps. There's loads of boot camps that I've seen, Danton Park, um, if you want to take your mum and dad's along and enjoying one of those it's also it's really sort of good to see how they coach and instruct people now you'll find that every personal trainer and there's many personal trainers i'm sure you probably know more than one um they all coach differently and i think one thing that i learned when i joined david lloyd is the fact that i used to stand there and watch the different trainers coach and just take a few things on board, not necessarily meaning that they were coaching how maybe I wanted to coach or if they were coaching correctly at all. It was always good for sort of to sit back and sort of see how they instructed people, what their cues were. Um, and the more you're sort of around that, it, it will help leading into the path when you sort of go into the level two um, qualification. Now, when the time is right, um, I don't know what years you sort of go for work experience now, is year nine or year 10. Um, you can always look for some work experience with a coach. Um, try and sh- shadow a few, because like I said, every coach uh, teaches differently. Um, it's always good to see. And I'm sure, and, and I would be willing um, if the time was right and it was able to, um, have some of some people come and shadow i think for me when i was younger i didn't have that person that i can sort of learn from um and i think if i was to go back it it was sort of maybe would have sped up the process of my my learning as such and um, now going through you've also things you can do is you can choose a few exercises let's say a squat something that further down the line you are definitely going to be teaching someone how to squat so you can educate yourself and obviously how to do the squat properly you can then start to find easy cues for people to understand you can obviously test this on family members um now what we like i like to think of is that obviously the education that i or you will learn from your qualifications and your btec a level is also through the science aspect okay but you relaying that information in science terms to a client it doesn't work unfortunately so you need to be able to get get the science you understand and then you try and coach them with easy to understand cues so like one thing is i can give you an example let's say with your um hips when we go into like a deadlift you've got an anterior pelvic and anterior posterior pelvic tilt now you may not know what that is okay but someone like a client you trying to teach them a a hinge pattern and you go right i need you to go into an anterior pelvic tilt they'll probably look at you and you'll they'll get lost in your eyes so you so cue like for example imagine there's a car door behind you and try and push your bum through and close that car door Things like that, that will get them them to push their hips back that you may need. So there's things that you can sort of educate um, and it will give you a few years to find those cues um, to use. And then the final one, which I slightly touched on before, is get a mentor when the time is right. So maybe when you're sort of starting your level two um, qualification, try and get a mentor or a coach um, within the profession that can help to guide you down the right path. Um, I currently two years ago uh, bought on a mentor for me and it was probably the best thing I ever did and I probably wouldn't be where I am now without one. Um, yes, it's good to the start of those years um, when I first got the job, you are going to make mistakes and you, you learn from those mistakes. 
Um, but also I feel like if I had one a little bit earlier, um, my path would have been slightly different. Next. So what do I love about my job? So to be able to be my own boss, obviously, even if you were to start and, and join, say, David Lloyd, and you're an employee, doesn't matter if you are an employee, you, the PT side of things is you're still your own business. The harder you work, the more clients you get, the more money and then the more, more exposure. Now, I get up in the morning and I look forward to going to work. It's very rare that I have a lot of my friends at the minute that are doing sort of um, plumbing apprenticeship, apprenticeships and they hate what they do. So to be sort of at my age and love what I do is something obviously you, 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 can't, you can't beat. The one thing that I really focus on is the, a change of mentality. So instead of people saying, I have to go to work, something you have to do, I get to go to work instead. So I'm priv- I feel privileged I get to go and help people and make them move better, feel better, um, through the physical side of things or just that social communication. Uh, the intrinsic rules I get from knowing that you are helping people change and shape someone's life or even just being the hour of their day that they really look forward to, especially in the corporate world where I'm from, the hour that they get away from their desk is their stress, stress-free hour, something where they don't have to think about, they can just come down, enjoy themselves, and then they can get back to obviously what they've got to do. Being your own success story. Um, for me, I've obviously had a bit of help along the way, but knowing that all the hard work that I put in now is the greater good, obviously, of my business, um, but also will be the byproduct of my future life, say, in 10 years' time, whatever that will be. Um, and then, obviously, as a as a personal trainer, there isn't a limit, unless, obviously, you're, you're an employee and they're giving you a salary. If you are self-employed, there's not a limit of potential earnings. Um, but I always say is don't chase the money. Love your job. Do everything for it. And then everyone, everything will will fall into place. Um, so just bide your time with that. I don't know how I'm doing on time. But um, my advice. Um, now, what could I tell my younger self? Personal training isn't an easy job. Okay, I think there's a misconception um, within the industry and people looking into it um, because there are things like these six week courses that which will qualify you as a level three. Um, people don't value what we do enough. At the end of the day, you're still a professional. You're you're someone's hand in you. Their sort of life is such and to make sure that they don't get injured. Um, and obviously, they're paying for you for your time. So I'd say if personal training is something definitely you want to do, please obviously follow that. But you need to obviously going to put in the work. Um, I've had done many courses. I've worked long hours, unsociable hours. Um, like this morning, my first client was at 20 past six. And then some evenings, I might not finish till half eight, nine o'clock. So you're going to obviously have to put in those hours during the day. It's not a, it's not just a nine to five job that um, that most people are used to. Um, things are not handy to you on a plate. But I'm a true believer, obviously, if you work hard and are passionate, good things will come your way. Now, the job that I am in now, I actually got recommended by the nutritionist that used to work at my first job. So I left David Lloyd and then got an email from this this guy asking if I'd come in for an interview. Now, that work I put in at the start of that, when I first got that job, I didn't know what would come out of it, but my hard work, obviously someone someone saw that, and and, and that's the reason why, why I'm here and where I am today. Um, so talk about college percentages. So within my class, I think there was 19 people doing a level three qualification. Um, and I believe there's only two people still doing the personal training now. Bearing in mind that was what, four years ago. So like 19 people, only me and one other girl has carried that on. Whether because maybe they made the wrong choice with the qualification and they didn't enjoy it, 
I think also some of them, when they come to do this, they thought it was an easy ride. And if you're just going to sort of go with the flow and just do the bare minimum, the income for you will not be enough and you will then have to start to look um, elsewhere. Be a yes person. So anything within that you get offered, always, well, obviously to an extent, but if it's something that you want want to focus on within the sort of the PT job and you've got an opportunity to grab and take, whether it's for, probably would be for free to start with, always say yes. Always be willing to learn. Always ask questions because asking questions, even if they may seem stupid to you, are always good questions because you learn from them. But it was also where you grow. The amount of questions that I've asked, say, my mentor, um, and in my head I'm thinking, oh, he's going to look at me and go, oh, I can't believe you're a personal trainer. It's not that at all. It, it helps me grow. It helps me learn. And it's like definitely one of the things in the past to see where I am today. Last last slide, I think. Um, so this is a little quote um, which I'll leave you with. Um, it's something that resonates with me quite well and I heard from a fellow coach is comparison is a thief of joy. Now, a lesson for each and every one of us, but also a great coach, a uh, great co quote when it comes to sort of clients and getting them to understand their journey. Within the industry, for me, if there's so many personal trainers out there and sometimes you get stuck in the realm of sort of comparing yourself, especially with see, me being 21 when you when I joined David Lloyd, it was like, oh, there's a there's a 28 year old PT that's been here for five years. How how am I going to get how am I going to get clients? And why would they not go to him and come to me? And that messes with messes with your head. So always don't compare yourself to others. Believe in yourself, no matter when you start your when you start as a personal trainer. Doesn't matter what age you are. Um, don't compare yourself. And obviously, when it comes to the clients, um, I think social media is sort of the biggest at Instagram. They'll look on Instagram, look at these influencers, say, oh, my God, I want my body to look like that. Especially, unfortunately, for the ladies, that's what tends to happen. And they start comparing themselves and they start beating themselves down. That it, Instagram and influencers, are they're, they're, they're fake. It's not the true representation. So just getting the clients to understand that comparison to be for joy is a great quote as well. So it's something you might want to write down um, and keep with you going forward. Love what you do. Live and breathe your passion and people will be attracted to your personality. Um, I, like I said, I love my job um, and people will thrive off your energy from that. So if you feel like personal training is for you and you love the fitness side of things, um just live and breathe it and and you'll you'll go far uh get comfortable with being uncomfortable there's many situations um that make me feel uncomfortable still i'm not very comfortable with talking to loads of people um i don't like talking on on like through instagram um social media but it's something you have to get used to and you need to sort of just get yourself out of that. So within the schoolwork, there might be things that you, you feel uncomfortable with, but just try your best because um, that's obviously where you're going to grow. Be an individual, be you. With there being so many personal trainers out there, you need to showcase your character as that will, is what, what sets you apart from the rest. I believe that is the last slide. So um, obviously I'm sure if or if... If you've got any questions, please fire them away. Um, but I'll just leave you this here. Um, my Instagram, if any of you want to just sort of have a look at what I do in my business. Um, I also have my website there and my email if any of you would like to ask any further questions um, about, obviously, personal training, what I do. Um, I'll be more than happy to help. And I think that is it amazing thank you so much Mars. and that's been a fantastic talk and we've got lots of questions flooding in so the last couple of minutes if we're okay to ask a couple of questions before i know you've got to shoot off and thank you so oh, much no, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. um that's fine. so we've got one from james who would like to know how corona has affected your job so how coronavirus uh, sort of restrictions have affected your work so um it was tough 
uh, when it first obviously when it, what was it last May uh, April um, everything had to go online so obviously you could go and see clients on a one-to-one basis outside um, but the thing is when, when you sort of own your own business and you've got quite a large clientele base driving around to see everyone takes time and obviously that time is being taken out of your day to do other things so everything for me had to go online so through zoom um, which was obviously a godsend um, and luckily with the rapport that I had with my clients they all transferred online so I would say I'm very lucky in the sense that I've managed to keep a lot of my clients and they're all they're all still on zoom um, so yeah it's it's impact I know it's impacted a lot unfortunately the boys, that I used to work with at the studio that I left David Lloyd for, they actually had to get rid of it in April. So all my clients that I used to train there, obviously I going moving forward, I won't be able to. So I've got to then come up with a solution of how to train those. Um, so it has affected a lot of people more than others. Um, I think it's just being prepared um, was one of the key things. Yeah, amazing. And I think it's a very difficult time, but it's great that you've been able to sort of adapt. And like you were saying, Zoom has been amazing for that and doing different things over that. Um, I've got another question for you from Faith, who's asked, would you recommend your job and why? Would I recommend my job? I'll be biased, yes, I would recommend my job because, like I said, I I love what I do. And to say that at the age that I am, when I've got many a friend saying that, they hate what they do um, and they can't wait to get home. I'm happy to work, wake up at five in the morning if it means I have to see a client at six. I'm happy to stay at work till nine o'clock. Um, I think when, when you love what you do, um, I love the interaction with people, socialising, but I think the main thing is helping people better themselves. I think that's how I get, I get rewards. Um, when they leave my sessions with a smile on their face and knowing that sort of in years to come, say in 20 years time, they might come back to me and go, oh, I can pick my child up still at six years old. I've got no back pain. I've got, it's that longevity um, of what I do, which is what I enjoy. Amazing. Yeah. And I can see, you can feel the passion for it, which is amazing. Really nice to see. Um, We've got a few more questions. So I've got one um, from Oscar and one from Alfie who are asking about sort of how self-employment works. If you're not working for David Lloyd anymore, how that works and sort of how you get paid and how you get your wage. I don't know if mm-hmm. you could sort of explain to students how that works when you're self-employed. So there's two there's two avenues. So you can go down, you can be a sole trader, um, which is basically you just work for yourself, being self-employed. Um, you get income clients will pay you um i'd advise opening up a business account um like a bank account um clients will pay you obviously you need to keep track of all the money going in um and then i believe the tax year is april to april so it's a year's worth you won't get taxed say when you're employed your paye and you'll get taxed the company will do it for you you don't monthly you don't get you don't have to pay anything When it comes to April, you have to do a tax return for that whole year. So if you don't save during those months, when it comes to the end of the year and they go, right, okay, you owe this amount and you need to try and fork that out, that's obviously something you'll need to look at. Um, So I'd always say, imagine you have to pay that tax, take the 20% out, um, well, it depends on obviously how much you're earning. Um, So that's one way, or you can own a limited company, which is what I do. Um, so everyone, my clients pay my business. I'm actually an employer of my company. Um, and then I pay myself dividends from that just because of tax benefits from doing that, um, is lower. Amazing. Yeah. And I think that's a really good insight into sort of different ways that you can, can earn money and, and understanding that. And I've got one question around similar to this got lots of questions about wages this afternoon and sort of when you are working as a personal trainer what sort of and I know it will vary of wage is the annual salary for the PT work it, it, 
it varies it really does and it depends i would say to be a a successful personal trainer and to earn the income that maybe you'd like to you have to be self-employed you cannot work as an employee for a company because they won't pay you enough um because obviously they need to take a cut of what the client is paying um so yeah i'd say being a self-employed with that but you can earn any you can earn six figure salaries as a personal trainer so don't feel like there's a cap and that's the one good thing that i have found is that there's no limit i don't the more the harder i work the more clients i get the more income i get and then the greater that salary will be at the end of the year so there's things to look at as obviously hourly rate that you want to do you want to prescribe yourself and what, what you value yourself at? Usually, most personal trainers would, around this area, is sort of 35 to 40 pounds an hour. That's what, if you go to David Lloyd, that's what David Lloyd would charge a client, um, a member for. If you're self-employed, you charge what you want. But obviously, you've got to be able to back up why you are charging X amount. And what I was charging when I was 18 is not what i'm charging now because once you get those years of experience you do more courses that obviously adds to the value of the client um and then once you go into london as well obviously the rates in london are a lot a lot higher absolutely thank you and i think that's really interesting to sort of hear how that can can change and vary and it keeps progressing as as you go through your career and Mars, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's been amazing to Pleasure. have you. And I thank know that our students much. have really enjoyed it. So a big thank you from us and really great to see your Instagram and your website. And I'm sure lots of students will be having a look at that as well today. So thank you very I'm much for your time. Brilliant. And we're going to say goodbye now, guys. So we will see you tomorrow afternoon for our final day of insets. And thank you so much, Mars, again for this afternoon. Bye, guys. No worries. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.